Good evening. We are so excited to be with you today. I have a very special guest that I've been looking forward to speaking with and to hearing what he has to share with us about some of the most valuable approaches to improving brain health. And one that has the most evidence so far is exercise. And I know that many of you have had questions about exercise and how much exercise and what's the best exercise, et cetera. And yes, if you can get by without exercise, no, nobody's asked that so far. I think everybody knows we need exercise. Also other ways to stimulate our brain, such as with photobiomodulation, which is a developing technology for providing us Phot photon stimulation directly to our brains through either directly through the skull or through device that's inserted in the nose, painless device that you just clip on the nose and it sends light beams up to your brain. So those are two of them. And then just the concept of con connection also and the role that all stimulation plays in helping our neurons connect with each other and be more efficient in conducting their communication and information transfers. So we have with us tonight, we have Dr. Alaric Aranander. And Dr. Alaric Aranander is a neuroscientist and educator. He lectures internationally, and he's a leading researcher in the neurobiology of brain development and human potential. So his PhD uh, is in neuroscience. And for the past 55 years, his work has helped establish the field of neuroscience as science's leading area for exploring human potential. Dr. Aaron Ender has conducted pioneering research at the University of California at Los Angeles, Penn State University, University of Wisconsin, and Maharishi International University in Iowa, as well as Maharishi European Research University in Switzerland. He is the director of the Brain Research Institute, conducting research into home human potential. He's the president of The Leader's Brain, a consulting company that helps CEOs upgrade their brain functioning for more leadership success, and president of the Anti-Aging Company, offering organic healthcare products for youthful brain and aging. Dr. Aaron Ander began research into aging and Alzheimer's back in the late 1970s at UCLA. Brain development and health was central to optimize the aging process and prevent a number of chronic illnesses and also Alzheimer's disease. He has also presented around the world on the topic of brain health and longevity, and he has an online Vimeo series on youthful brain, which is enjoyed by individuals from over 50 countries. And I have to say that I have had the pleasure of knowing uh, Dr. Aaron Ander for many years and doing some work together. In fact, about almost 20 years ago, we did a mini series on the brain and brain health and longevity uh, that long ago. So that was before Zoom the Zoom platform, we did that in person to a live audience, and it was a lot of fun and very enlightening. I learned a lot from Dr. Aaron Ander, and I'm really looking forward to learning more from him today, as I know you are as well. So welcome, <laughs> Dr. Aaron Ander. Great to have you here. Well, it's and a real pleasure, Dr. Nancy. Thank you. And here you are with, um, maybe it's a Zoom background, because I don't see those waves moving, but just everybody, just so you know, Dr. Aaron Ender does live in Hawaii, and every day he's out there on the beach or in the garden being active and exercising. Wherever I've run into Dr. Aaron Ender around the entire world, and it's been as far as Thailand and Switzerland and, and <laughs> Hawaii, he is, is always on the move. So we're, we're he's well qualified to talk to us about this topic today from personal commitment as well as neuroscience so <laughs> yes so um, we're made to move and uh i've had a lot of fun over these many decades working with dr nancy on all these different projects in particular aging and so forth um so it's a great joy to be back with you again and all the people who are listening now to you and are taking your help to make their brain work better so it's just a joy to be with you and all of you 
Thank you. I, I might dive into something. First of all, aging is related to sedimentary behavior. That's the take. Sedimentary behavior is aging. All right. The more sedimentary behavior we have, the faster we're going to age. And what happens is that if we could exercise, it's been shown by research now to reduce dementia by 50%. That's a lot. Just exercise. And we're not talking going to the gym and pushing weights and so forth. There's some real simple things you can do to make all the difference. And when we talk about the research, which we're going to, and I'll try to keep it relatively brief in some areas, we're going to talk about risk factors, your risk for dementia or your risk for Alzheimer's, or your risk for falling off the ladder or getting in an accident. But you have to remember these risk factors, which there's many, and a lot of them we will never escape from because if we live in a city, we have to breathe that air and be with the people in the noise or whatever the case may be. So there are lots of risk factors. We minimize the ones we can, but the research I'm going to talk to you about is for the average person in this country in general. And the average person in this country in general is not very healthy, all right? Two thirds are overweight, half are obese or a little bit less and so forth. And there's millions of people with Alzheimer's. So just to keep in track, when I say risk factors and I give some research, it may not apply to you. Many of the people that are with Dr. Nancy are very intelligent, relatively healthy people because they're asking Nancy how to be really, really healthy. Okay. Now, some of you may actually need some extra help, and that's okay too, but most of the research I'm talking about is the average person, which is very unhealthy. So if you're better than the average person from what you know, right, in terms of your weight and your cardiovascular and your sleep patterns and your diet and all the things you do with your lifestyle, then all of this you put into the context of the fact that you're doing better than most, okay? That's reassuring, Dr. Aranander. Thank you for that preface. <laughs> Good. So how would you like to proceed then? Well, <clears throat> I think that you are known for having very dynamic slides, and I think you can just dive in. And then when we're through with your presentation, I know that people have questions for you. So then we will okay, have good. to take those questions. So everybody, please put your questions into the chat if you haven't submitted them already. And we'll do as many as we can after I get done with this brief overview of exercise, and we're gonna go through this uh, photonic thing as well. Okay, so let's start with some slides and I'll share the screen then. And we can hear fine, yes? Yes, good. It's thinking, there it is. So confirm you have one screen? Yep, looking good. to good. All right, so you got a brain. Everybody's got a brain. Your brain is everything because it's running the show. And you have a body that supports it so they can run the show for a very long and very healthy and happy time. And exercise is a powerful tool for this ageist brain. And part of what, a large part of what Dr. Nancy tries to help you do is to have your brain work better. So here's a picture of what your brain looks like. You have to realize this, this is a marvel. This is part of the most complicated thing in the entire universe. There are 100 billion brain cells. Each one has like 10,000 connections. So that's quadrillion connections. There are wires in your brain. You know how many wires? There's enough wires in your individual brain to go around this planet twice. So if I was to unpack any one of your brains and put all the wires together, I could run a thread around the planet twice. And you have lots of blood supply because your brain uses about a qu quarter of your blood and nutrients of your body. So you need a lot of blood moving a lot of materials to be really healthy. And guess how many vascular pipes you have? You have enough capillaries and vascular system in your brain to run around this planet four times. That's a lot of material trying to create a network which is gonna to function to support your happiness, your behavior, and your long, long life. And what we're going to do is get into your brain and indicate that right from the beginning now, we have to understand there's a dialectic, there's a, uh, you could say a conflict. We know that 
genes make your brain. That's obvious. And where do our genes come from? Well, the genes have an evolutionary history. <clears throat> a good 300,000 years of evolutionary history have packaged the genes that you have today. Even if you're only 30, 40, 50, 80 years old, your genes were structured over 300,000 or more years. So there's an evolutionary history, an evolutionary design to be a certain way to support a lifestyle which is vibrant and healthy and as long lived as possible. But we also know that, and this has come up in the last 50 years of modern science, that the genes really aren't the story per se. What is the real story in aging is experience. Because your lifestyle, your every moment of experience influences how your genes work, which ones and what way, under what circumstances, which then determine how your brain functions. So you want a certain brain, it requires your genes to work in a certain way, which requires a certain type of experience. If you want a different brain, you need to put a different set of experiences in so that your genes will adapt to those new experiences. If you have a brain, you don't want to do anything different, don't change your life. Whatever you're doing now is working with your genes and creating the life that you want. But if you want something more, a healthier, happier brain, a longer lived life, then you need to look at what experiences you're putting in to control your genes. Because basically, our Western lifestyle has betrayed the evolutionary history and the genetic design. There's a genetic design of how we should be, and it's what we do every day. Basically, each day we work by moving our fingers. Each day we relax by watching the TV. Each day we do things that are not evolutionary valuable to make our brain as best possible. So let's look at the sequence of what we're confronted with and how we can fix that, especially with exercise. So here is a chart. It's very simple, actually. On the left-hand side, you have your brain. Bottom is normal. The top is abnormal. So you have quality of brain functioning on the left-hand side. And across the bottom, you have time. And you can see it says preclinical MCI, which means minimal cognitive impairment, and then dementia. So there are like four zones. You're growing up, you become preclinical, there's some problems cognitively, and then you move into dementia. This is a clinical disease stage, and we're going to take a look and see what happens, just so we're all on the same page and how exercise can stop and prevent and reverse this. So at 30 years, what we know from modern science is that 30 years, human life as we know it, in other words, the average American, peaks. After 30 years, almost all the cognitive functions start slowing, either fast or slow. So we ramp up when we're young, we get 30 years, and then there's a tip of the iceberg, and then we start moving downwards a bit, either fast or slow. So 30 years, we're doing, we're doing great. We're cranking, okay? But at 30 years, we also know that you can find amyloid in the human brain. You could be 25 years old, 30 years old, and have amyloid. And I'll be like, oh my God, amyloid, it's terrible. Well, amyloid is really not the problem. Because when you're 30 years old and have amyloid, you don't feel any problem, for one example. On the other extreme, you could be 90 years old and be in like great shape, happy, clear, the whole thing. And when you pass away the tomorrow, they look at your brain, they go, it's completely clogged up with amyloid. The point here is that amyloid is not the basic problem. It's a, it's a outcome of the basic problem. And that is amyloid is now known to be a protective mechanism to deal with the onslaught that's happening to your brain, that things are coming into your brain which are not wanted. And so it's a protective thing against all the toxins, the lack of proper food, the lack of proper energy. And so by 30, there's some buildup of amyloid. If we move on to 50 years of age, we find that by that time, there's synaptic dysfunction. Your synapses, all these little connections, there's quadrillions of them, your little connections, they come and they go. In fact, it's considered that almost all your connections over a year's time have changed. They might've been like this to start with, but the next month they're like this, and then they're like this, and this like this. You go on, but your synapses are changing all the time to adapt to who you are. But synaptic dysfunction grows with aging, and we're gonna go into that as well as neuronal injury, okay? And by the time you're 70, we're starting to lose brain at a significant level. 
Now, after you're 30 years of age, we're losing little brain cells any, every day anyway. We have so many, it's not a big deal, okay? Don't worry about lo losing brain cells on the average. But by older age, with an improper lifestyle, we're losing a lot of brain cells. And almost all of them we're dealing with is in the cortex. You know, the cerebral cortex on the surface of the brain doing all the computation and so forth. It's very thin. It's only three millimeters, the thickness of a handle of a spoon. Okay. And it's this thick. You can't even see this. That's how thick this is. Right. So we're losing brain cells, but we're also having the possibility to gain brain cells, which we'll, we'll discuss. And then there's cognitive loss and the finding dementia. So everything you see here is because of lifestyle, not because of genes in almost every case. There's a few set of genes, two genes in particular, which can be problematic, but most people do not have them. And even then, there are genes that can compensate in many ways. So all of this isn't necessary. All of this is due to lifestyle, regardless of whatever history of your family, okay? So here we have, we're juggling life. This guy's juggling, he's got a clown face on, we're all juggling stuff. We're juggling business, family, laundry, shopping, we're juggling. And it turns out that actually if you juggle balls like this, anybody could juggle balls, even if you're not even coordinated. If you juggle balls within a couple of weeks, you're brain gets bigger in the areas that juggle the balls. And if you stop juggling balls, the brain areas recede. So the brain responds to whatever you put in. If you put in juggling, your brain will respond to that. And this is because, as we know now, every experience changes your brain. So whatever you put in, that's what you become, okay? <laughs> and we're gonna talk about how movement and how light can be experiences that can change your brain and improve the aging process and reverse the process towards dementia and Alzheimer's. So in general, exercise, exercise impacts chronic illnesses. All the chronic illnesses are improved by exercise. Obviously cardiovascular, diabetes, so forth. Mental health, most mental conditions and just mental health in general is impacted. Traumatic brain injury, having your head hit, so forth. Different addictions can be impacted. And of course, aging and dementia, which is the primary in uh, interest of this group. So let's start and go through how spe specifically aging and exercise interact. So the big name in the room, and everybody knows this by now, is neuroplasticity. That means the brain is pl plastic. It can change whatever you put in. That's what the brain does. If you put the same things in every single day, your brain recreates that same brain. If you put something new in, your brain will adapt to create that new thing in the midst of who you are. And uh, exercise improves neuroplasticity. In particular, it improves the ability to have neurogenesis, which means to generate new neurons. Although we do lose some neurons every day, we also produce new neurons, in particular in two areas. One in the memory centers of your hippocampus, maybe a couple thousand are produced every single day. And in the prefrontal cortex with all the executive high level cognitive functioning, they're also getting new brain cells. And of course, the, these new brain cells, having been born, grow up and get incorporated, get absorbed into the networks that they're into so that we can improve and maintain your memory and your cognitive functioning and so forth. And this is part of what exercise has been shown to do. And in particular, it's using a compound called BDNF. BDNF, that stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor. In other words, the brain cells produce it. When they produce it, it helps brain cells. So they're producing their own sort of superfood. Brain cells know what they need. And if you give the exercise, it says, oh, I'm going to make some BDNF. And as a result of that, I'm going to make better synapses. I'm going to make more cells. I'm going to have better blood flow and so forth. So BDNF, which is shown on the left-hand side here, it's, it's a little molecule that you produced, in particular by glial cells. And the brain responds to this through exercise. In particular, vascular effects. When you exercise, you get more blood flow. More blood flow is obvious. It's going to give you more oxygen, always a good thing for the brain. You're going to get all your nutrients flushing through. You're going to flush out your detox phenomena. You're going to have better mental functioning because there's more blood flow. You're also going to get more growth of the capillaries, angiogenesis. 
So you're going to increase how many capillaries and how well they're working. So the blood supply is going to work better. Great vascular effects for immediate and long-term benefits. You also have mitochondria, which are the energy producers in every single nerve cell and every cell of your body. And it's going to impact the mitochondria. And we'll come back to that later. In addition, there are little glial cells that are like the immune system, okay? The brain immune system, these little pink guys shown here, and they're responsible to protect the brain. So if there's bacteria from your mouth, oral bacteria, gingivitis, or if there's some fungus or there's some toxins or there's some parasite, which all these things get into your brain, then they will take those and remove them so your brain remains healthy. They also have a very important role in neuroplasticity. Remember I said that when you have a cell and you have a connection to that cell, that that connection doesn't last long, maybe an hour, a day, a week, a month, and then it goes away and something else replaces it. Well, when you replace something, you have to clean up the situation. And the immune cells, the microglia, clean up all the old synapses and help that whole plasticity work. Now, if something is happening in the system and there's brain inflammation, which means you get an onslaught of some toxin, something in the air, or something you breathe, or something in your food, a pesticide, or something gets into the brain, then what in happens- the rodent hippocampus, is an that... area of the brain involved in learning and memory. This micro-etching can be lit in two principles. Is that basically, we're finding a time when, when you exercise, the microglia will help work with the exercise and calm down the whole level of brain inflammation. So our lifestyle normally creates brain inflammation. In fact, most people in the United States have some level of body and brain inflammation and the microglia are in there trying to do the best they can, but they get out of control. Exercise can bring back control and reduce brain inflammation, which is one of the major influences on the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's. And then finally, in terms of benefits from exercise, the brain gut health. We all know now that there's a microbiome and all those little bacteria are eating up your food and creating stuff. And depending on how good your intestinal walls are and so forth, you're getting very good nutrition and factors that go to the brain and influence the brain. Exercise is known to improve the microbiome, which will therefore in turn improve your brain functioning. So let's summarize then the benefits of exercise. And they are, you're going to get a happy brain. What is a happy brain? It means you're going to have more neurons. There's going to be less shrinkage. Your memory centers are going to be better. You're going to have happy connections. Through neuroplasticity, things are going to be more interconnected for thinking, feeling, and behavior. You're going to have happy blood flow, which means you're going to have more blood flow. You're going to have more capillaries for more nutrition and better detox. You're going to have happy mitochondria, which we'll go into more detail later, which means you'll have more energy. You have to remember that 70% of elderly people who do exercise improve their mitochondrial function. Emotions. Everybody who's done some exercise, you may feel a little tired afterward, but when you're sitting there after your exercise, you actually feel good. You feel satisfied in some way. So emotions get better. You can remove and help anxiety, depression, and uh, PTSD, and so forth. And then finally, happy tummy. The microbiomes are improved. So how do we get physical? All right, here's some basic ideas, practicalities, time. You can spend anywhere between 150 minutes a week or three minutes a week. So 150 minutes a week is the World Health Organization. It's their recommendation for the amount of exercise per week of moderate to intense exercise. In other words, just not walking, but something a little more moderate and intense. That means like two and a half hours a week. That would be great. Unfortunately, about 90% of the people in the world don't do that. So you can imagine we have a lot of benefit coming forward if people were to change. Now, on the other extreme, if you don't want to do a lot of exercise, you can do something like, and we'll get to these in a moment, some burst exercises that within a short period of time can accomplish almost the same thing. So either long or short, but you need to do some. The recommendation is don't try to do a big deal. 
Start with something simple and build on it. Be easy. Don't try to accomplish everything at once. I know you're motivated to improve things, but do it in a way which is sustainable and practical. The most practical approach to exercise is now considered burst. It's also considered something called high intensity interval training. H I I T. High interval, high intensity interval training. That means the next time you go out for a walk, walk your leisurely pace. After a little bit of time, then walk as fast as you possibly can for one or two or three minutes. And then go back to your normal pace for a while, relax, settle down, and then do it again, burst again, and then come back to regular. That bursting is so much more effective than just the regular walking. That bursting is so much more effective than regular biking or swimming or playing or cleaning or anything. Burst is a way to very efficiently allow the BDNF, the blood flow, the whole dynamics to be incorporated into the brain style. Okay. And you can do it everywhere and anytime. We have to th we have a thinking, oh, I'm going to go to the gym. So that's something separate from sleep or eating or showering. Okay. But you should think of exercise as a 24 hour thing minus sleep. Okay. Which means, for example, when you're walking, anytime you're walking, let's say you're walking upstairs. Don't take the elevator, walk upstairs. For one flight, just ramp up that flight and the other flight, just walk normally and cool down. If you're gonna bike, bike normally and then crank on the bike for a quarter of a mile or less and then settle down again. Same with playing. You should go out and play with kids and really play with them. Just don't sit there and tap them on the head, but get in there and play with them. Get some exercise. When you're cleaning your house, you can all of a sudden, if it's the right exercise, start really moving that vacuum cleaner, okay? And organizing stuff in your room. Get your closet organized and really work at it at a fast speed. All these things seem like it's not exercise, but it actually is. Same with gardening. There are all kinds of workout videos. Just look at them online and you'll find out which are the best ones for you. The ones that are entertaining and motivational and so forth. And you can, they're only you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. There's also something called nitric oxide release. Nitric oxide is a compound, many cells, in particular your blood vessels. And it's stored there and it's released when we use the cardiovascular system. So what happens if you do a burst or if you just exercise, but especially burst, what happens, you release this nitric oxide into the capillaries, into the blood vessels, and two things happen. First, you get more blood flow. The lumen grow, they dilate, and you get more blood flow, which is always a good thing for every organ is more blood flow because the brain over time with aging gets less and less blood flow. The second thing is that nitric oxide and all the effects release BDNF, which is again, that nat natural plastic thing. And then the other recommendation I have is something called foundation training. Now you can find that online at foundationtraining.com, all one word.com. And this has two values. First, it's a set of, and it's all very simple. It's five minute exercises or 10 or 15, whatever you want to do. And it's a, a ton of variables. You can do them while you're driving. You can do them while you're sitting in front of your computer. You can do them at the beach. You can do them watching TV. You can do them while you're cooking your meal. These are all things that do two things. One, they create strength in your muscle groups. And two, they create balance in the axial structure because balance is really important. Because what happens in older age, even if the organ systems are working, if you fall down and hurt yourself, it's not a good thing. It's hard to get back going. So we wanna keep our balance really good. And that means you want body strength of the muscle groups and you want your muscle groups to be working together and foundation training is fantastic. There's some free stuff on YouTube and then you can pay for a course if you want to. So this is the exercises you can do and all of them can be done regularly and with burst mode. Now, what about exercises for the mind? Dr. Nancy wanted me to bring in exercises for the mind. So let's do that for a few minutes. So you go online you go, brain exercises, and you'll get all kinds of hits. There's probably 20 or 30 of them out there. You know, it's just like there's 20 or 30 kinds of soda pop, but they're all got fructose, so you don't want to go near them. But there are a couple which are really good, and in particular, there's one which has almost all the research. This one is called Brain HQ, it stands for uh, 
headquarters. So Brain HQ is the most researched compared to all the other ones for brain fitness. This one is really well done. It's been done by Michael Bajanigic out of uh, San Francisco. He's been, he was Mr. Neuroplasticity back 30 years ago, and he created this whole thing to help people with the aging process. And this particular mode, it's very inexpensive. It's really fun. There's a lot of variability. It's really intelligent. It works with your level of functioning. If you're feeling really good, it pushes you. If you're feeling not so good today, it backs off and gives you a chance to still be successful. So it's very intelligent working with you individually. You can do it in your cell phone, you can do it on a computer. And here's a quote for you. As a result of using brain HQ exercises, I can see more of what's happening more accurately and therefore make better decisions faster. Tom Brady. Now we're not all quarterbacks, but this is basically what we're all faced with. If you're driving a car, you, you, you're juggling what? You're juggling the steering wheel and the car. You're juggling the road and its environment. Who's out there? What are your stop signs, other traffic? You're juggling a conversation or the radio. You're juggling your thoughts about what just happened in the meeting. So you're trying to drive this car safely, accurately, with good decisions, and not get in trouble. Whether it's sitting in the office behind a computer or sitting in a car, <clears throat> you want to perform well, and brain fitness is brain HQ can help you do that, and you can do it very easily. So basically, you find that brain HQ in all of them, but brain HQ in particular because it's so well done, it deals directly with your working memory. So working memory is basically everything because when you're, for example, when they're driving the car, you have the car, the environment, a conversation and your memory thoughts. And all this has to be packed into a vessel called your working memory in your prefrontal cortex. And you're keeping track of all these variables. You keep track of your speed, the road conditions, other cars moving, what the conversation's about. But that working memory can only do so much. It can only be so good for distractions, right? What happens if, if somebody drops something and you look over there quickly because somebody in the other seat drops something, you look over there, you get distracted, you're no longer paying attention to the road. Something could happen. So working memory is what can you hold on to? How well can you integrate it? How well do you can controlled distractions. Oh, yes, I noticed something, but I'm still driving. And all of that comes down to how, how well you do in life, whether you're a CEO or just driving your kids to school. Your working memory is basically how you function, how you think, how you feel, and basically how you behave and get through your day. So working memory, they did some studies and they found that working memory improved. They studied visual processing speed, tracking, and response. So what does that mean? They give you something on a screen. They say, how fast can you follow something? How fast can you move and can you track different things? And what is your response, all right? They do something and you have to respond, okay? So it's basically, it's like driving a car. And they found that if, if you look at people that are elderly, over the age of 60, that when they do this exercise for about a month's time, that they gain about 10 years against the control people who don't do it. In other words, if you were to start doing this and spend approximately the 34 hours in the next month doing this, you would, and you say you're 65 years old, you would at the end of the month be now performing like a 55 year old. In other words, you'd be doing better. And of course, if you're an older person, some insurance companies like that, and they'll give you a, a discount on your driving insurance because they know that you're gonna be able to see things faster figure it out faster and then respond faster and not get in accidents so they lose money because all they're interested in is not losing money. And you're going to help them not lose money by just being really good at tracking what's going on in your working memory. So the exercises that HQ does and have shown by research, and again, I mentioned HQ because they're the only ones who really have done research. Almost all the other ones, and some of them are enjoyed and are interesting and so forth, and they can be used so many of them are, you know, inexpensive, but HQ is inexpensive too. A lot of it's free, but they've shown you can improve your memory, your attention, your brain speed, your people skill, your intelligence, 
your navigation and so forth. Not bad for sitting in front of a computer or on your cell phone and having fun with the game. So again, it's an investment in time. Just like exercise is an investment in time, you can do this all at once or sit down and do it over in micro things. So it's better to do exercises, mental or physical, in small batches rather than long batches. All right, cognitive exercises. So let's summarize then our cognitive exercise. So you have to decide whether you want to be on a computer or smartphone, you know, whether you want to be mobile or not. You have to figure out how much time commitment you want to make, right? Do you think you're going to get away with a couple hours or minutes a day? Maybe, maybe not. The HQ requires probably an hour a day for their research results. Motivation. How are you going to be motivated? That means is what you're doing, is it relevant to your life? Is it relevant to who you want to do and be? Okay. And then the cost. Again, HQ is pretty inexpensive. Not much at all. And the benefits. Does it really help you in real life? And, and with HQ, yes, there are benefits in life. People find great benefits. And it actually has been shown, HQ, that you can reduce the aging process in the terms of cognitive functioning. And then finally, is it stable? Most of these cognitive exercises in the early on versions weren't very stable. You did them, you had some effect, and it would go away. But now they're getting more and more sophisticated, and they're able to train the brain in a way that if you keep doing them, the benefits remain stable. So again, you, you got to put the time in if you want to get the benefits. So with that, then, we've completed our exercises in terms of physical and in terms of mental. And in both cases, they're going to help you to live a long life, to have a better brain, and reduce your chances or even reverse some of the process of dementia and Alzheimer's. So the next area is photobiomodulation. Okay, so it's three words stuck together. Photo means photo or light. Bio means a biological system, your skin or your brain. And modulation means you're going to manipulate or modulate. So photobiomodulation is also called PBM. So it means that you're going to use light to change the biological system. That means you're going to use it for your skin or your bones or your muscles or your joints or your gums or your brain or your eyes. Not for your eyes, not good for the eyes. Okay. So it was originally called low-light laser therapy, although most of them don't use a laser at all. Most of them are light-amplified diodes, and they're not. this is a non-invasive, self-administered thing, right? There's nothing going into your skin. Everything's on the surface, projecting inward. So it's non-invasive. You can do it yourself. Pretty safe. I haven't seen, except for the eye thing, don't want the light in your eyes. There's very little side effects of any for this photobiomodulation. And since 1967, when it was first discovered in the laboratory with little mice and wound healing, it's become a big deal now. And the research is getting better and better, and it's to an advantage for people with uh, growing into dementia and Alzheimer's, or if you want to prevent from getting there. So it is uses LEDs, which means light-emitting diodes, those little diodes you see now everywhere, and you can get different colors, or lasers, which are the coherent light sources. So the key issue with PBM is penetration. We'll go into that in the next slide. That means if you put some light on your skin, like if you're outside in the sun and the UV rays hit your skin, it's not going to go very deeply. So there isn't much penetration. And so the UV isn't going to damage anything under your skin. It's just going to damage your skin. But if you want to actually have an influence on your brain, you need to have a source which is going to get through the skin, the fat, the muscle, the bone into your brain. So penetration is an issue. <clears throat> and then finally, there is basically you can stimulate, like you can put an array on your muscle or your wound, and you can help that wound heal or your muscle feel better or your joint feel better, or you can drive it by pulsating it at a certain level. So let's look at photobiomodulation. On this screen, you see that there is a spectrum. On the far left, you see the infrared. It's sort of dark red into red. And in the middle, we see the visual spectrum, right? Roy G. Biv. And then to the right is the ultraviolet and purple violet. So this is the spectrum, most of what we're confronted with, if you don't think about radio waves and so forth. Now, obviously, we don't see the ultraviolet. We don't see the infra infrared. We only see the visual spectrum because we have receptors for this lifespan, right? We have receptors in our eyes. 
but only see the spin. But you actually have chemicals in your body which can see longer wavelengths. In other words, we have chemicals in your, in particular your mitochondria, that can actually be reactive to very, very infrared type of radiation. So either red or near infrared. So here are the frequencies. These are the two main frequencies used in the field today. Something close to 1064 nanometers and something close to the red light or 810 nanometers. This is almost everything in the field. Red light is visual. You can actually see the light. The diodes of NIR, the near infrared, they're there, but you don't see it because your eyes can't see it, but it still has an effect. So let's look at penetration. Here is a model of your skull. You can see, the, forget about the lines right now. When this, this little piece of tissue, we start with skin on top, and then we have blood vessels, and then there's a little layer of muscle, and then at the bottom there's bone. So we go from the inside out, of course it would be in the case of uh, brain, you'd have brain in, inside. So you have bone inside, and then muscle, and then fatty tissue, and then dermis, and then epidermis. Okay, so that's what the figure shows. Now there's five lines, and these indicate five types of radiation. The far left one is UV, and you can see that line only goes to the upper the epidermis. That's why when you're out in the sun without sunscreen, that basically you're penetrating the epidermis just a little bit, and that'll stimulate vitamin D production and also burn some skin cells, and you'll get some inflammation, which is called sunburn, if you do too much. The next one is blue, which we would actually see. And that blue light actually <clears throat> would also penetrate and actually penetrate a little deeper and won't do much of anything, but we'll still get in. Then we have green light, and that's penetrate even more. And then finally, we get into the visual red. This is 6, 630 here, but it could be the 810, and that's going to get in even deeper. So when you use the red light, you can actually get into the skin, into the muscle. So red light is really good for skin and some superficial muscle. And then the last one is the near infrared, near infrared. This is 810, it could be 1064, but in this case is an example of 810. And you can see that this penetrates through the skin, through the cutaneous subtissue, through the muscle, through the bone, into whatever is below the bone, which in this case could be the brain or the bone marrow or whatever. So frequencies determine the penetration as well as power. In other words, how much energy there is in that light source. The more power, obviously, the more ability to penetrate because every one of these forms of light, every one of these particular wavelengths is going to reflect to some screen, it's going to be absorbed to some extent, and it's going to be distributed to some extent. So the more power, the more directed it can be. And then you can pulse it. You can either have it on all the time, or you can have it pulse, pulsing, 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 pulsing. That 10 times a second or 40 times a second, it can pulse. <coughs> me. So with that, we now have research showing that it can influence skin health, muscle health, bone, oral gum tissue, and brain, right? If you've got some arthritis, it'll help. If you've got muscle pain, it'll help. If you've got skin wounding or skin problems, psoriasis and so forth, if you've got gum problems, and if you have brain problems. The real big, big deal now is brain and what it can do for Alzheimer's and dementia. And I think you're probably interested in more of that than you are for skin. But you never know. So here is one example. The, one of the leaders in the field is called V-Light. And here's a lady. And as Dr. Nancy mentioned in the beginning, it's a very simple apparatus. There's two pieces to it. There's the headgear. On the left, you see she's wearing that headgear, which is very comfortable and sits around. And she has a little nose piece. This nose piece just clips on the nose and goes up about half an inch into the nose. It's, you don't even know it's there. I mean, it looks kind of silly in a way, but you don't know it's there. It's, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't bother you. And when you have that, this V-light is able to do two things. <clears throat> The ones on the surface of the head can penetrate into the brain to influence brain health. And I'll go into that specifically. And we'll deal with mitochondria, the energy source. That's is the main thing. And the one in your nose projects up into the brain from the bottom. 
So that's the intranasal and the transcranial. So transcranial goes across the skull and the others go up to the nose into the bottom of your brain, which is in a very important part of your area, hypothalamus, prefrontal cortex, and so forth. So the results of PBM in general are that when you use PBM, you increase blood flow. In a moment, we'll get into the mechanism, but basically blood flow is really important for anything, wound healing, arthritis, brain defects, and so forth. And if you have the right power, the right frequency, and the right modulation, you can do a lot of good. Because as we know, with aging, there's a decrease in energy functioning. Mitochondria aren't so good. There's an increase in inflammation and so forth. And the, these apparatus for PBM can actually counteract that significantly. So blood flow, energy. As you mentioned, energy in the brain gets reduced over time. If you can increase the energy, things are going to just work better and better and better. It's like taking a cappuccino. It just You get more energy, which means things work better. And you're going to get more BDNF, and you're going to get more antioxidants. You're going to get better synaptic functions and so forth. And ultimately, at the end, you're going to reduce inflammation in the brain because there's better vascular flow, there's more energy available, and you can decrease the amount of inflammation with the glial cells and so forth. So the mechanism is now a big deal in terms of mitochondria. Every cell, that cell on the left there, has a nucleus and all these different little pieces in there that do different jobs. One of them is called the mitochondria, which means a very thin little uh, thread. Okay, They look thread-like in a cell. Here it's kind of like a bulge. Now, these cells produce your energy. Right? Everything depends upon energy. If there's no energy, nothing works. If your cell phone doesn't work because of the battery or if your flashlight doesn't work because of the battery, you know what I'm talking about. These cells produce your energy for everything. And there's a whole sequence of chemical reactions to produce chemistry that will produce your ATP or your energy molecule. And one of the key components is something called cytochrome C oxidase. Don't worry about that. It's a chemical which turns out to be light sensitive, not sensitive to regular blue light, but sensitive to near infrared light or red light. So this is almost like your eyeballs where it's sensitive to light, but it's buried in every cell. So as a result of being sensitive to that particular frequency of light, if you put on the near infrared light on the skull or on the skin, it'll penetrate, reach the cell, enter the cell, and stimulate, interact with those little protein, actually it's a giant protein molecule in the mitochondria. And as a result of that interaction through a sequence of specific steps, it'll allow more energy to be produced. And that more energy is like what happens when you get a cup of coffee or you just get a real hit of excitement or something. It, it really makes all the difference in how the brain and the body works. Everything needs energy and with age, that energy supply is usually reduced. So basically, our mitochondrial health is really important. And if you can improve it, you're going to have all kinds of benefits. They found, for example, with V-Light, that you could take 80-year-olds, and in 12 weeks, you're going to increase their cognitive functioning, increase their psychological structure, you can increase their blood flow, and you can actually increase how their brain waves are coordinated with each other, which in the end, Network coordination is the most important thing. So energy for network coordination for your consciousness and your life. So it's a hierarchy. If you don't have the energy, it's hard to have the networks. If you don't have the networks, it's hard to have a life. So if to get a life, you got to at least have the minimal, which is that energy flow. And then you need to make sure that you get as much coherence and integration in your brain networks. Okay. And so... These systems, these light systems, have been shown now to work quite, quite well. And they have been shown to improve Alzheimer's, dementia, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, Parkinsonism. And actually, if you apply it to the lungs and to the nasal, it'll help with COVID. It reduces the edema and the inflammation in your lungs and can actually help the inflammation and the edema and all the problems in the nasal cavity. So 
It can be applied anywhere you need more energy to get rid of inflammation, because inflammation seems to be the universal problem that starts or accelerates every problem we have, including the aging process. So PBM, you can get it, mitochondrial health through PBM, or you can get it through exercise. We mentioned earlier that exercise actually improves mitochondrial health. You can get it through caloric restriction. If you're not familiar with that, it means that if you don't eat all the time, there's some period of time where you're not, not eating. In other words, your caloric intake is restricted to, let's say, from 12 till 6 only. If you only eat between 12 noon and 6 in the evening, the rest of the time, you're not eating. You're not snacking. You might be drinking water and stuff like that, which is good to hydrate. By the way, hydration is really important for the mitochondria. So caloric restriction is a very powerful way to improve mitochondrial health. And actually, it helps clean up the system because if you restrict calories, then the body starts cleaning up because it needs to be more efficient. And it'll get rid of all the bad old mitochondria, fix cells, get rid of old cells, synapses, and so forth. So PBM, exercise, caloric restriction, and diet. The right diet can help mitochondrial health. And then finally, there's supplements. Uh, you can get now on the market. Two years ago, you couldn't, but it's going to be a big deal now. On the marketplace, you can get something called Mito Supplement or Super Mitos or whatever name they want to use now. And they all have primarily the same ingredients. And all these are the ones that have been known for the last 15, 20 years. Nancy, Dr. Nancy was mentioning these back 20 years ago when we gave lectures, okay? Nothing's new under the sun here. All it is is people starting to wake up and know that amyloid is not the problem per se. It's how you live your life, which is the problem. So Dr. Nancy was there early on before anybody was even aware of the significance of lifestyle. But you're lucky to have her and lucky to have her benefits. So we have here then the supplements. And uh, there are all kinds of supplements. And if you want to go into them, you can. To make it simple, in this case, I put on here a slide that shows you brain kits. Now, this takes you to our website. You don't have to go to our website and buy anything. It's not, I'm not trying to upsell anything here. I'm just trying to make it easy. If you go... Oh, here, there are videos to say, if you're vegan or non-vegan, here are the sup basic supplements for the best mitochondria and brain health. And here are the brain kits based on how much money you want to spend. Okay, you want to spend a little money, this is the minimal. If you want to spend more money, you can get this. It's not a grocery store, not everything's there. But those little videos will help you understand what you might want and then go wherever you want. Go down to your Safeway and buy them or buy them from wherever you want. I'm not trying to upsell these. I'm just trying to make it easy for you to learn this stuff or go online and say, what are the brain kits? And then you'll find them. So in conclusion then, I just want to mention that our brain has patterns. It has networks. Everything has to be glued together, literally. It has to be working together. And there are hundreds of billions, quadrillions of pieces that have to figure out how to work together. And to do that, we need to put the proper lifestyle in the support that endogenous ability, that intelligence. And to do that, we know that brain health is all about connection, how we connect to our environment, our diet, our exercise, how we connect socially, but it's also about how we connect in our brain. And in this particular presentation, we mentioned mainly outer technologies. You can put something in your nose, you can stick something on your head or put it on your wound on your arm, or you can run around in circles, okay? You can do anything on the outside and they all will have some benefit. Everything you do has an effect more or less good or bad, but it will have an effect. I wanna finish by just mentioning that there are inner technologies, which many of you know about, and I, I like to encourage you to, to learn more and to use them because they can be very powerful. And in fact, part of the best exercise that I've known about in the last 50, 60 years is the exercise of brain training where you transcend and you train your brain to order. If you have a more orderly brain through a few minutes each day, You'll be more aware, more awake, more attuned, more sensitive to what you need. You'll actually get it done and you'll recover and benefit faster. Because in the end, the exercise and anything else you want to do with your lifestyle really depends upon how aware you are. Are you really aware of what's going on and what you want to do and can you do it? So with that, I just fin finish with to let you know that you have a brain. It is cosmic, literally. Now, you can think that's kind of mumbo jumbo, but some of the biggest guys in the world now call it cosmic too because you can't figure out how intelligent it is. 
It is unbelievable. You have in your brain more computational power than all the computers on the planet. And that reads to all forms of possibilities. It's never, you're never too old. Your brain can do whatever you want it to do. It's ready to help you. You have neuroplasticity as, as the genetic component to live through and be anything. So nurture your networks because they are you and they're waiting for you to take charge and do the right thing. So thank you for that. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Nancy now and I'll end the share. That was there you fantastic. Go. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And so much I try to contain myself. I know it's your most it's your favorite topic. I I know. You only did a PhD on it and spent your entire life studying it. So but we we catch your enthusiasm. It is infectious in a good way. So we appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we have lots of questions in the chat and maybe we can Bring them on. Uh, yeah, we can we can uh, we can answer those. And one of them, I think maybe it was the last one. Somebody's asking, could uh, is there something you can recommend that is less expensive than V Light, which is way more than I could possibly afford? Yeah, V Light is expensive. It runs, you know, at, three three plus, well, three thousand plus. Yeah, there might be um, the last I checked. Well, maybe it's not so recent, but I I think it was even. At least when I looked into it, when I trained in this, it was 1750, 1800, but maybe that's a discount deal. I don't know. Yes. But, you know, yeah, I. There's did... two components. There's one with which. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, actually, there's two there's this, the, the head map, and then there's the intra, intranasal. Okay. The intranasal is relatively inexpensive. You just do that alone, it's not that much, and actually gets the whole bottom of the brain and so forth. So. If somebody wanted to try that, if they had a nasal problem or a brain problem, that's a relatively inexpensive. But the head apparatus, especially the minimal one, they're like 1700 each, and there's one at 10 hertz, and there's one at 40 hertz, and they have different effects and so forth. So it's a lot. Yeah. Yes, I don't. I don't know that I know any other brand to uh, recommend. <clears throat> no. But that doesn't mean there aren't fully, um, you know capable devices that may cost a lot less. I did a quick Google of photobiomodulation cheapest, and it did come up with quite a few results. And I think you would have to research it, but I don't think it's, it has to be, you know, $2,000. Right. And well, V-Lite has the most research. Yeah, V-Lite, right. V-Lite has the most research and they're, and they're, they're quite good. And uh, I, I personally think that somebody's trying to do everything in their life if you did a really good exercise program and took care of yourself and your supplements and your diet i don't think you need be light now somebody might say i got a real problem and i'm going to throw everything at it and i say go for it you know because it's not that expensive in the end i mean yeah. you can spend three hundred thousand dollars in a nursing home so you know yes good point so we have a friend lost her sense of smell and taste after eye surgery. Would V light possibly bring back these senses? It's a great question. We don't know, but it kind of makes sense that if that the olfactory nerve was damaged, maybe somewhere due to this surgery, mm -hmm. that maybe there's some chronic inflammation or something that, if it's not like severed completely and irreparable, that possibly it would help. And also Ayurveda describes a sniffing herbalized oil in the nose as being a way to enhance healing and to help to reduce inflammation. Sesame oil, for example, has anti-inflammatory properties. And I would tell you, even if Dr. Aaron and weren't here, one of my favorite oils for the nose is called nose to brain oil, which is made by the anti-aging company. And it has many herbs that are known in Ayurveda, as well as verified by scientific research to be helpful for the mind and the brain. So I would, I would certainly say that's a cheap way to, you know, help bring some healing influence to the olfactory nerve. And V-Lite? If, inter, inter, if, if yeah, that, the V-Lite intranasal just by itself may be worthwhile. 
Never, I would think you know, so. You know, like how much is getting, it depends on how much you care about not being able to taste your food or smell anything. If, you know, if we, we can't say, but I think if you want to roll the dice and say, Hey, this sounds like it has some potential and I've got an extra $2,000 uh, tax refund or whatever, or you can afford it. You know, it's an individual decision, but um, it's certainly- I think with a try the internasal itself I, I think they sell the inter i think they sell the internasal uh, uh, as a loan i think so because i can find a price for internasal by itself and that was in the hundreds of dollars okay ah, from so the light, the light. maybe for a couple hundred dollars you could have that alone but you could call them up and say what do you got for all factory regeneration you know they'll tell you whether you know and mm -hmm. for a couple hundred dollars i'd like to be able to smell and taste of course taste is another whole story but to smell it's really important to smell for a lot of reasons. Good. So I'm going to go back to the top for those people who've been waiting a long time with their questions. Uh, Ron asks, exercise any particular type or just get out there and do something, run, walk, lift weights. I I think you answered that. Think, that was so early in the talk. You you did yeah, get I think, that. Yeah, I think, yes, you maybe missed it. So basically, turn everything into some exercise. And if you can, do a burst. I mean, and work on isometrics. For example, if you have a piece of paper, okay, here's a piece of paper. Where is it? Right here. Can you can you crumple that piece of paper? All right. Everybody should be able to crumple a piece of paper and turn it into almost nothing. Okay. So, hand grip strength is a risk factor for dementia. The less strength you have in your hand is indicative of your risk for dementia, as well as how thick, how your diameter of your leg. They did a female identical twin study, and the twin that had the twins that had the wider legs, more muscle, they lived longer, less dementia, which means they were more physically active. So the thing is, do more, do it everywhere. Uh, the idea of going out and I'm going to spend an hour here, then that gets usurped because you're going to do something else. We should do it instead of watching. TV, stand up and do squats in front of the TV. And you should look at McCullough's nitro thing. It's, it's four exercises, basically. You do one, which is squats, another one, which is robo. Then you do presses, which you squeeze your elbows back, you go up. And the other one is this. You do that for about nine minutes, and you've just cranked on your whole brain and mitochondrial system for nine minutes. I you wouldn't have to go out and play tennis unless you like tennis. You just did what you needed to do that day in nine minutes. So it doesn't take a long time. And you can do it on an airplane too. I do just what I showed you on an airplane every time I travel. Every hour and a half I get up and I do my squats and my robo and the whole thing. And the steward is saying, what is he doing? I'm saying, I'm alive and I'm aging well. So anyway. <laughs> All right, great. Um... How does our brain size shrink with aging and why does it? Why, why does the brain shrink? Mm -hmm. um, you're losing mass, you're losing wires, and you're losing thick. Uh, right. Most of your brain is fat, which means most of your brain is insulation against all the wires. Remember, you have a lot of wires, and they all have to be insulated with fat. So all that fat and the wires, if you lose wires and you lose insulation, there's less and less fat and things kind of shrink down. If you lose brain cells, you lose vascular, shrinks down. If you lose size of brain cells, shrinks, everything's shrinking down, shrinking down. You look at an older head and it's like pulled away like a little walnut. It's not out there, it's in like a walnut. So basically we're losing brain cells every day and we're gaining brain cells. If we behave ourselves, we can take those baby brain cells and use them. But if we're stressed or have the wrong lifestyle, those baby brain cells never survive and we don't have that benefit. Yeah, that's a really good point. We can create those baby brain cells, but they got to be nourished just like, you know, any young thing, a baby plant, a baby yep. person, you know, they need care. You got to be kind to yourself. It really comes down to self-love. If you don't love your brain and love to want to do it, then it's just... You got to really want to take care of it because it's taking care of you and it's being you. So any more questions?
Well, That's exercise, what kind? I think we heard that burst is is especially good no matter what you're doing, whether you're cleaning yeah. your your closet, you can do little bursts of faster activity. Yeah. If or you clean walking. the counter, you can clean the counter like this, you can clean the counter like that. Just don't I mean, hit your hand on something sharp when you're doing that. Yeah, and don't don't wipe out the kids or you know, like dog or the cat, you know, just be kind of careful of your environment. But the point is is that if you're vacuuming, you can vacuum fast too. If you're walking, you can walk fast right yeah and i would if recommend eating, people start gradually start gradually because especially if you're a right. person who's over 60 the and you haven't been doing this consistently then muscles tendons ligaments joints can be less robust or structurally sound and one can injure oneself more easily so start slowly work up gradually and then you will not injure yourself and take yourself out of the game for too long as That's very, 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 very important. Thank you, Dr. Nancy. The caution. Yes. Just, do, uh, just be sensible. Uh, you want to speak a little bit about Maharshi Yoga Asanas and brain health? I don't think there have been any studies on it, but yoga as a whole and its effect for, for brain health or health in general. Okay, so there's two... Th a couple areas, the yoga, hatha yoga, the, the asana exercises, that's what you're referring to, yeah? So mm -hmm. one is that when you're using them on, on a gross level, you're moving the lymph around, okay? And when you move the lymph, you're getting toxins out and you're helping the whole body work itself out properly. So you have lymph movement, okay? Another thing is you're using the joints and the muscle systems in a coordinated fashion to be able to work together and and get enough range of motion so they don't freeze up in a certain way. Okay, so you're twisting and turning and so forth. Um, there is some research back in India a while back that showed that you can improve aspects of the immune system, you can improve aspects of the respiratory system. Um, that's been old stuff, I haven't looked at it recently. But in the, in the end, Although there's that gross level that you're doing because you are the body moving the body. The essence of Maharshi Yoga is that when you take that position, then you've effortlessly slipped into that silence. And that's a moment of transcending or maximum brain coherence. And so basically every move movement is to get to a point where you're not moving. And then you're not moving. And then you're not moving. And so in a way you're alternating between movement and silence, dynamic and silence. And that is a cultivating thing for your brain and your physiology and the ultimate value of it. Yes, it's very interesting. One of my patients actually credits yoga and taking up yoga class regularly uh, with helping him improve his cognition, even though he had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And he said it it allowed, when he first went, it was very difficult for him because he really had trouble following and then figuring out how to put his body to um, mimic the uh, instructor. But over time, he caught on and he learned and he felt so good and empowered from having learned this new thing and also doing it that, you know, it has effects on circulation as Dr. Aaron is just mentioning circulation, lymphatic circulation, the detox and blood flow and enhancing blood flow and relaxation and bringing um, consciousness and the attention on the body, connecting the, the mind to the body and improving potentially balance depending on which ones you're doing. But it has a lot of benefits. So because the mind, the mind is a powerful thing. It, Anytime you hurt something, your mind automatically goes there. That power of attention is, is really extraordinary. It takes all the intelligence of the physiology and enlivens it. So you're using the natural and healing process in the body by having your, systematically having your attention on the body. And a lot of research showing now that when you use your attention in different ways, you can have really great effects to reduce dementia and improve the cognitive functioning. And I think there's a free yoga class every Friday where they teach these um, this this particular subtype of yoga, Maharshi Yoga, and it's every Friday. And I think if you go to miu dot 
edu website and you would probably find an announcement about it and how to join that it started during COVID, and it's very popular they've had over a thousand people on doing the asanas on fridays so uh, we have another question what about conditions like arthritis which can make exercise more difficult i have a few things i can say about it but do you have anything off the top Doctor. It depends upon where the arthritis is. Is it is it systemic or just in the wrist or in the hips? Or if it's systemic, then yoga asanas is probably the best because then there's less there's less pressure. Um, you should be in a pool of water and do non gravitational exercises. Uh, you, it's amazing. There are aero, aerobic groups in almost every swimming pool in the world now where they have exercises in the pool. And that can help you tremendously. And then, of course, heat to some extent, but then the red light near infrared could be actually even better than cooling. If you cool something down to prevent inflammation, it also delays the whole process. But if you just put the near infrared or the red light on it, it actually helps remove, creates a blood flow and helps the whole thing settle back down. So um, those are my recommendations. Those direct anti-inflammatory effects as well mm -hmm. from that light therapy mm -hmm. and of course there's a lot of dietary things for arthritis absolutely ayurvedic principles of eating which can be huge is not eating much uh in the evening eating easily digested food like soups and cooked vegetables and avoiding any cheese or yogurt at night i saying it again because i said it on a previous webinar and someone said Oh gosh, that's exactly what I've been doing <laughs> every night. So she was looking forward to trying to eliminate that from her diet. And also <laughs> drinking boiled hot water during the day, throughout the day can be very powerful effect to help cleanse the body of impurities that may be building up in the joints and promoting more inflammation. So there are many, many things that you could do to help. And uh, arthritis. The spices, gen ginger and turmeric are anti-inflammatory and so, yes, there are many natural things that can help. And those were excellent points, Dr. Aaron Ender, about um, exercise in the water and, and yoga, definitely. And what, what people find usually is that when they exercise regularly, they actually have less pain and more limber. So it's not that you're going to hurt your joints by doing, especially if it's the right exercise. And you may want to start by seeing a physical therapist if you have insurance or if you're on Medicare, your doctor should order some uh, course of physical therapy. You can get individualized advice depending on what your issues are as to what kind of exercise and even get a set of exercises for home. So there is, there yeah, is. Uh, remember, remember your, your gene, your genes were engineered for to depend upon only three things, all right? All needs is really good diet, it needs exercise, and it needs proper rest and recovery. That's all the genes were created for. If you're doing something else, not good diet, all the processed food, if you're not exercising, and you're not getting good, powerful rest, then the genes can't do what they're intended to do, which is give you a long, healthy life. It's just, it's, it's actually quite simple. And uh, our Western lifestyle has gotten completely away from our genetic potential, completely. So Sean is asking. So it's easy. You got Dr. Nancy to help you. As we use up nitri nitric oxide, what are good nutrients to replace that? Nitric uh, oxide is okay. Go ahead. So nitric oxide is produced all the time time except for it's sort of stored up and then released when you activate it mainly through exercise but also through the light and so forth so when you do the burst you don't want to burst all the time that's the whole point of long endurance stuff it's going to be hard on the system because you use up the nitric oxide and then it's not there for you so if you burst it's going to use it up and give it a chance to recover so you burst and then you let it recover and then you burst again and so forth so basically nitric oxide is just produced by the body and it's just part of the system for regulation for the blood vessels and so forth. Exactly. And, and it's possible that, you know, getting, uh, boosting the production, uh, beets are known to help 
boost the production. And, and in fact, one of my patients, she said her mother, who was in her 90s, had been to the ER a number of times due to high blood pressure that was getting out of control and they were having trouble you know, keeping it down. And she said, well, what they found worked was they just told her to eat, well, her daughter said, try beets, mom. And she started eating beets once a day. I think even out of a can, not exactly Ayurvedic, but it's hard to cook those beads. And, and she said her blood pressure came down and, and stayed down. So it can be powerful. There, there are other foods that are also known to do that. And, and L-arginine is promoted as it's an amino acid that also has been studied quite extensively and can help with nitric oxide production and sometimes will help with blood pressure as well. So. What about Tai Chi for balance? Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> That's a great yeah, exercise. I, I think Tai Chi is fine. Yeah. It's yeah. a much it's a much slower one and it doesn't work on isometrics. Okay. That's a separate issue. That's more of a flow pattern and stuff. The group I mentioned, the foundation training, has a combination of isometrics and balance because it's trying to restructure your core so that you're working from your hips up as opposed to flanging around out here and so basically it, it strengthens the whole axis using isometrics it's just like hand grip right if you do hand grip just a little hand grip makes all the difference all you need to do a little bit of that and it makes a difference right there is bursting exercise right there you don't even have to move just do that with your hands and you've done a burst exercise and there's yeah. some apparatuses for squeezing and so forth and Tai Chi, I think it probably over time will create a similar effect because to stand on one leg and move the other leg, I mean, you are having to strengthen your core if you're not falling over. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it it, mm -hmm. it also is great. It's kind of kind of like what appeals to you because what works is what you do consistently or right. repeatedly. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, find what you like, find what what exactly and comfortable for you. It doesn't have to hurt to, to be good for you. So this is a really fascinating question uh, from Patricia. Once we hear, one, often we hear that having exercised quite a lot in childhood or early adolescence, that this exercise history benefits one throughout one's older years in addition to the current exercise one is doing. Thoughts and comments? Don't rest on your laurels. That's my first comment. <laughs> if your laurels are your bottom, <laughs> don't rest yeah, on, I, on your yeah. childhood exercise. But yeah, well, in general, before we're twenty or so, there's a lot of usually there's a lot of activity. Used to used to be. Now they're watching cell phones and TV. But it used to be there was a lot of childhood playing and then exploring and running around. And they sort of forgot there's nature out there now. They just look on a cell phone and see there's a waterfall. So basically, in the early child years, what you do sort of structures a, a pattern of how your cells and your body work together. And that pattern is a sort of a platform that then takes you on in life. If you had a good pattern, it can really help you. If you had a poor pattern, then you're going to have to work to redo it, okay? I mean, you can always redo something no matter what, how old. You can be 80 years old and still repattern your body and your mind and everything. So... There's no end to the aging, but those first years are when everything is being created, your sort of momentum. Um, so. Yes, yes, it's very interesting. There is research on that er that that topic and even um, showing that the brain development and is greater in the prefrontal cortex where it's a kind of thinking, planning, judgment, and in our hippocampus of memory we, in in people, young people under you know the age of twenty five, when the brain is still really really developing, not that it ever stops, but it's it's um, it hasn't reached its full adult volume and and everything, and also that it affects metabolism in ways that later in life make the body more resilient in the face of maybe some period of time when the diet isn't as good or something. They're less likely to get diabetes and such. So. It, yeah, well begun is half done is a is a saying in this tradition. And uh, so I think it applies to humans as well. So, but there's added benefit. You yeah, can't I mean, just sit around in your old age and expect that you're going to be healthy. Yeah. Uh, just to go back for a moment. I mean, 
when you're growing up and you're doing these exercises, you're building your bone patterns and your joint patterns, your vertebrae and all your joints and how good your bones are and how strong they are and, and how good your joints work and how it's just, you're creating a structure that you're gonna live with the rest of your life. And, uh, and it's gonna be hard to modify those really kapha strong, hard elements. They don't work as easily as the liver will and stuff like that, because they're much more stable and structural. So you're creating a platform for your whole physiology, okay? So if you know young people or you have children or grandchildren, you know, Make them exercise, make them be active, yeah. get them in the sports and, and things that keep them running around. Uh, yeah. It's, it's really dangerous. Let them, let them save your life too, by running around with them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Tell them, tell them that you have to run with them. <laughs> That's the deal. I have to run with you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Let me see what next we've got. Where can we get light therapies to use ourselves? I think we kind of touched on that. <laughs> you know, yeah. look in the Google Marketplace. I, I don't know uh, the V light. If, if, you know, sorry, there's, light there's two areas. Mm -hmm. There's there's two things. One is if you want something for the body, joints, skin, muscles. This it's very simple. There's just a little sheet, and you just apply it. They cost almost nothing. Maybe fifty bucks, a hundred bucks at the most. What's it called? And, uh, what's it called? Pardon. What is it called? Just say near infrared um, muscle recovery or something. Just put okay. near infrared or red light treatment. And there's just some simple stable ones that sit on the skin and use them for like a half an hour, 20 minutes. But then there's the more sophisticated ones where they pulse and the whole thing in the brain like that. Mm -hmm. So if they're not after the brain, they can get a very inexpensive one for muscles and joints. Like I, when I'm out in the yard and I overdo my shoulder because it's getting on in age here. Um, I put the little thing on there and it makes it feel better, you know, because it helps reduce the inflammation because I have a tendency to overdo it because I'm out there go doing your purse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So PBM penetration are all the wavelengths from UV to near infrared found in sunlight. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's out there. You're getting bombarded. It's just that these, you know, there's more power. I mean, it's very, they're very light. So. And so, uh, Mary is commenting on Maharishi light therapy with gems is experienced by many as a powerful technology as well. And that is really true. I've heard many patients tell me that they've done that treatment and, and felt benefits for their digestion or for chronic pain or, or whatever. So it's, it, that is a using actually gem stones and putting light through them and and then that light shines on the body it's very very interesting fascinating and they're chosen in a particular way for each person do the infrared saunas have the same benefit they do have some of the same benefit to the cells well if you're in yeah. if you're in a sauna and they say it's infrared with lights beaming down then you're going to get full body penetrate you're going to get full body thing but it's most likely not that powerful but it could have some benefit sure on the skin and nothing, nothing else skin and muscle maybe it may, may not be strong enough to penetrate the cranium but if you're in a sauna and they have some kind of general thing in the ceiling i assume that's what it is or on a table something like that then it should get to your skin and muscles and and help reduce inflammation which is part of a sauna scenario, purification. Uh, so Tinder says V-Light seems very unnatural. That's interesting. I, I kind of thought it looks, it seems pretty natural because we're being exposed to light. We're creatures that, you know, and most of us don't get enough sunlight. Um, it's certainly not, you know, unnatural in the way of having serious side effects or something. But, you know, you're welcome to elaborate on that. I mean, yeah, it looks really weird. You stick this thing up your mouth, uh, up your nose and have it pull flashing light into your brain. But but the research on it shows that it really is helpful. Even in right. people, yes, somebody asked, can it be used for people in their 80s who already have Alzheimer's? Yes, it can be. And it has been shown to be helpful to some yeah. people. Yeah. And it's, so, it's, uh it's, it's, we have two worlds. We have the world that the genes grew up in, which 
It didn't need any digital anything. It didn't need cars. It didn't need pizzas. It didn't need TVs. It knew how to grow and give you a long life by just having the proper nutrition, unprocessed, nutritious, and you had plenty of exercise and you had plenty of rest and recovery and so forth. But we don't do that anymore. Everything's digitized. So everything's computer. We don't talk to people. We sit at a table and look at our cell phones. So, I mean, if you need help because the lifestyle has led to a situation where you think I'm missing something, really missing something or sort of missing something, then the technology is there and use the technology. But my side is, is that it indicates we've had a long life of lifestyle, which just hasn't been productive, okay? Because it's just the fact that we can have amyloid at 30 years of age indicates something happened in the first 30 years that wasn't completely life-supporting. And if we get to the point where we're 50, 60, and we're still stuck with that situation, then if the digital works and it doesn't have side effects, which would be like doesn't seem to have any side effects, then if you have the funds, um, go for it. I, you know, I'm not against it. I just think people need to focus on the fundamentals to make sure. I mean, the bee light's not going to help you if you don't eat right. It's not going to help you if you don't sleep right. If you don't get enough rest, if you don't get enough exercise, it's not going to. It's not going to fix everything. Okay. These are all pieces that help reduce the risk factors. And if you live a life where you've had a lot of risk factors that have been pinched upon you, then you need to do what you can to reduce them as much as possible. And, uh, but we're responsible, you know, nobody they can do it for us. You know, there's no sort of magic pill. There's ways to anything to get more awareness and more attention. Like Dr. Nancy's series here is a help for you to all think about it and get a feeling for how you want to deal with your life. This is a, an hour spent to think, all right, I have these conditions or, or situations or symptoms and, 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 or I don't have any and I want more. And this is how we can do it. Just put your attention on them and be clear, but be holistic and, and, and realize you have to have everything working together because that's the brain's asking for that good diet, that good exercise and that good rest. I think we'll we'll end with that since it's already um, the Ayurvedic bedtime out on the East Coast. It's ten, almost ten o'clock. Um, there are so oh, many more questions that I think it would be unhealthy for us to stay too long for everyone. But yes, we definitely everyone would really loved your this presentation and would love for more questions to be answered in the future. And inviting one sure. said, "Why not come back for part two? And uh, Great. so wonderful. Thank you so much, all everyone who left your comments and had left your questions. Some of the questions that people are asking that we haven't gotten to are answered in the course, the 12 session course, as well as we have more opportunities with uh, six more live sessions coming up between now and June 24. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Alaric Aranander, neuroscientist, for coming today and sharing and teaching us about these details and inspiring us. I think inspiring. I think everybody feels inspired to do exercise throughout the day, to find ways to move. And uh, yes. really appreciate that. All right. So it's been a great for now. Thank you, Dr. Nancy, for helping all these people. Take care. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Aloha. Aloha. Bye-bye. <laughs>